Hi, the video you're about to watch I think is a really important video. It's a, it's a real journey of understanding. Now, I did this pretty much in one take, without notes, just sitting down to get what's in my head out on video. The first 17 minutes, the sound quality is pretty crap, and that's my fault, because I went rogue, did this without producers, editors, anybody, because I, I knew I had to do it. So excuse me for that, it does get better um, as we go on. Also, once I'd rewatched it, I realized that there were some footnotes I wanted to add, further clarifications, further learnings that I thought were really important into this. So make sure you watch through to the end as well. Really hope you enjoy it. And again, apologies for the crappy sound at the beginning. Hi. Um, in this piece, I'm going to be representing myself as Raoul Pal of Global Macro Investor as opposed to Raoul Pal CEO of Real Vision. I like to make the difference between the two because Real Vision doesn't have an opinion, but I obviously do. And I'm paid to have an opinion for some of the world's largest hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, family, family offices, high net worths, etc. And that's my research business, Global Macro Investor. I want to give you the big picture, the really big picture, where I think everything is going. And it's obviously mainly about the digital asset space because I think it's the single most important thing for everybody to understand. And in order to do that, I'm going to give you my journey of discovery so you can piece together some of what I've learned on my way because there are many narratives you've heard me speak about, but I haven't really put the whole lot together to give somebody or all of you something really meaty to get your heads around. Now, again, you don't need to agree with all of it, but I want to show you my journey, how I got here, what I think is going on in the macro backdrop, what I think this means and why I chose Bitcoin and then cryptocurrencies, why I diversified, what I think the actual space is really headed and where this whole thing is going and how it fits in to the future of everything. So there's quite a lot here. So it's gonna take a bit of time um, and it'll take probably a few watches of this to, to get across everything that I'm trying to talk about. Let's go back to the beginning. So 2008 was a period, in fact, I'm gonna go back to 2000. 2000, we started to see the debt bubble increase and the rise of central banks. So Alan Greenspan back in 87 was the first one to start using interest rates really to stabilize markets. That became modus operandi by, 2000, by 1998 when long-term capital blew up. The Fed did it again, again under Greenspan. Then 2000, we had the, um, the stock market crash and the recession. And again, interest rates were used heavily. Now, the money illusion meant that inter lower interest rates, people thought, I'm going to take on more debt. So they took on more and more debt. And that led to the housing bubble, as we know. And then that blew up and almost brought down the world's financial system. Now, I was in Spain at the time. I'd left the hedge fund industry, but I was still writing, as I do today, Global Macro Investor. And I realized that the fragility of the system was now becoming the most urgent thing, and that after 2008, we hadn't really solved it. In fact, it was bloody clear by the time we got into the European crisis in 2012 that it was not solved at all, and debt was the big issue. And the only answer at this stage became the printing of money because there was no other way to deal with it. It had become too big, too gigantic, too scary, too dangerous for anybody to let the fire burn. The whole Austrian economic idea of creative destruction was now almost impossible. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market, or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day, our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. For anybody to let the fire burn, the whole Austrian economic idea of creative destruction was now almost impossible to implement because the destruction would have been total and complete. 
And many people think, well, the bankers could have gone under. Maybe we should have let everything clear. Well, at this point, with this many old people as baby boomers in the retirement, into their retirement ages, you would have wiped out everybody's savings and investments too. And that is okay if you're starting from nothing. But anybody who'd started with anything would have been entirely destroyed. Now, this story shouldn't be a surprise to you because it is the story of Japan. We saw this in Japan where the Japanese realized that their aging population and their saving assets could not be destroyed. So the only thing to do was try and manage crisis via the role of the central bank and the merging with government policy and fiscal policy. And Japan has been basically the Petri dish for all of this. And almost everything Japan has done has happened elsewhere in the world. But after 2012, I wanted to make sure that there was a way out. Now, that was the first time I wrote an article. I think it was about 2013, I wrote an article called The Life Raft, where I talked about gold and, in fact, Bitcoin. I had started to have Bitcoin on my radar screen um, as some good friends of mine, some global macro investor uh, members, had been involved in the early days. I was going to set up the world's safest bank. That was the idea. A bank that, that only held US treasuries and that any money on deposit was entirely matched by treasuries that were held at the Fed. No, no rehypothecation, no nothing. So it was kind of a bank outside the banking system. I had that idea, but it was bloody hard to set up a bank. You know, people like Caitlin Long, I'm good on you. It's really hard to do. So I was running around the world looking at this idea and the Bitcoin idea came to me from um, Emil Woods. And Emil said to me, listen, this might be your answer. And I had seen it and looked at it and it was very interesting. In 2013, I bought it, it went up 100% in a month and I sold it. I was like, wow, okay, what was that? I wrote an article in 2013 or 14 about the stock to flow of Bitcoin, um, looking at it versus gold and saying with gold at about 1300 bucks where it was at the time, I would impute roughly without the great maths that uh, my friend Plan B has managed to do. But I had a rough rule of thumb that Bitcoin was probably worth a million dollars in comparable terms. Um, using stock to flow, you know, how much gold was underground, how much gold was being mined, etc., and in back imputing into the Bitcoin price. And that gave us a macro framework, and that macro framework became quite well known at the time and got passed around and got people, many people into the space, actually. Then um, I, I was out of the space for a while and then got back in around 2015, 16, um, and I started buying again probably around 200, and I think um, I sold out early. Um, when the forks were happening, that was the FUD of the day. You know, we, we'd had scandals all the way through S-curve moments within Bitcoin. And that moment in time, I didn't understand the ecosystem. I didn't understand um, the adoption effects of Metcalfe's law. And it was much earlier. So I thought this was an existential crisis when you're forking something. What did it mean? Um, um, I didn't really know. I wasn't comfortable. And I'd made 10 times my money. It was at 2000 at that point. So I took profits and obviously it then went up another 10x and I felt like an idiot. Uh, well, I didn't have money in the bank, but I didn't make as much money as I could have done, should have done. I didn't have a massive allocation, a deep, reasonable size, but not life-changing amounts. But it taught me a lot about the, the cycle. You know, I pretty much saw the top of the market and then it came down. And, you know, I still believed in what Bitcoin was, but I didn't think I had a time and a place right now. And I thought that that was important because Macro does matter to Bitcoin, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, and so it was off my radar screen. And, you know, I was looking at most macro opportunities. So we're talking about 17, so 18, 19. So 18, 19, we saw some interesting opportunities uh, in the bond market because I thought that the global business cycle was slowing down and we had one last shot at the rate trade. Uh, the, the heroic trade of loading up on euro dollar futures as the Fed had to cut and um, and offset the the rising in rates that they'd done and that the bond market was going to start pricing deflation again as my economic indicators started forward looking predicting a recession that came as we know in March but in March I, we go back a bit I had always said that crypto and Bitcoin in particular and macro were the same thing. They just didn't know it yet. 
And most participants didn't know it and didn't understand it. Crypto came from a different community. It came from a community of developers, the kind of cypherpunks. It came from Austrian economic school kind of philosophy. It came from libertarian philosophy. It came from a number of different things, but it started to attract the attention of finance people, particularly the macro guys like myself. You know, our job is to find assets that best represent our views and where we are in the world. And we are all, without question, troubled by the debt super cycle and how this all plays out. So when we saw Bitcoin, you know, one by one, people moved across. Famously, Dan Moorhead was first. Um, and then a lot of people, whether it was John Burbank, Mark Yusko, whether it was Dan Tapiero, whether it was myself, Mike Novogratz. I mean, bit by bit, everybody from the macro world, Stan Druckermiller, Paul Tudor Jones, Alan Howard, you name it, they're all moving across um, because they've seen the magnitude of the opportunity because we all knew that they weren't parallel paths, they were convergent paths. And they all converged last March. So that's when I got really excited when Bitcoin collapsed in the big liquidation. It had built, been building this beautiful chart pattern, that beautiful, massive, gigantic wedge I called the best chart pattern in the world. And a break of 10,000 was going to be the confirmation. And I loaded up with every single penny that I had um, available. Um, and so I put it all in to Bitcoin and it broke out. Because what was going on was we were now going into the biggest recession, maybe in all recorded history. So as you remember, my thesis was liquidation phase, which was into March, then I closed out on my shorts. Then it was going to be the hope phase. And then it was going to be the kind of insolvency phase. So the hope phase happened. And that was built on vaccines and things are going to be okay and herd immunity and all the narratives that happened. But something different happened as well. Interestingly enough, the real-time economies never really picked up for a while. They did exactly kind of as expected, but the markets did. The markets did the opposite. You know, I said we'd probably finish the year at kind of negative 3 to negative 5% year on your GDP growth, and that's exactly where we got to. So the hope was misplaced because the economy was shit and people had been laid off and the structural unemployment and many of the people in retail, for example, are never going back to jobs again. So there was a real structural problem. The insolvency phase should have been that the triple B entities, the giant corporates, should have run out of cash because they didn't have enough cash flow to paper over the debt payments that they needed to make. So it becomes harder and harder, their equity price falls and it all becomes more difficult. But that was also going to happen at household level where households were, yes, some people were furloughed, some people were given payments, but eventually the payments stopped. And if they didn't have jobs, the musical chairs stopped and you're kind of screwed. Um, and the same with small businesses. So we saw immediately the government do something he's never done before, which is instant transfer payments, which was stunning move towards a more MMT style environment where fiscal policy and monetary policy are roughly the same thing, or they work hand in hand, which is what we've seen in Japan over the years. That was amazing. It helped a lot of people and basically delayed the insolvency phase. Technically, many firms, many people, many businesses are insolvent, but they're kind of being kept alive by the central banks and the governments. And still to this day, we're still in that same cycle. It's become apparent, and I talked about it in the past, is governments and central banks have to do absolutely everything to avoid the insolvency phase. My guess was they were unlikely to resolve it all, and I think it actually plays out longer, and it is actually, in reality, in play, but we're not going to know until we try and revert back to some sort of normality. This is one of the key reasons why the central banks simply cannot allow rates to go up, because you will destroy any chance of recovery. So. Anything, if the market wants to go there and try and price, uh, price in higher rates, yield curve control is going to kick in. We've got pseudo yield curve control in Europe, and we've got yield curve control in Australia. We've got it in Japan, and I think it would come in the US. 
And that means that rates can't actually price inflation. Now, I'm not an inflationist. I think we will get cyclical inflation because of the supply constraints and the massive rise of people coming back into the labor force and back in economic life. But as we settle down, I think the debt deflation narrative, technology, globalization, aging population, all of this stuff uh, continues to weigh on inflation. And over time, as the economy settles to trend rate of growth, potentially inflation falls. I actually think trend rate of growth might change positively. And I'll come on to that at the very end of this, but it's not really a, a piece for this, and that all comes later. But it's the macro backdrop of that that is very important to understand, because within this, the only answer was the creation of more money. And that creation of more money was clearly going to be very, very beneficial to Bitcoin, because it was basically created for this. And I pointed out early on, back in March and April, that Bitcoin was two things. It was this store of, narr uh, store of narrative, store of value narrative. And it also had a call option on the future. And I started developing some big meta narratives to help get people across the line, because I know it's a scary different world and people didn't want to understand this weird digital money. I don't want to throw money at this. But I tried to explain to people in simple terms things like pristine collateral, how this is superior the many things that we have in the existing system, or in fact, all of the things that we have, how it acts differently, how you can't create more of it so it's collateral, it's worth more, and therefore is a better foundation stone for the financial system of the future, and how as a store of value, it offsets the monetary printing, and how this could all transition into a future economic system that had incredible value. And that's what made me irresponsibly long. And that, I think, helped a lot of people get across the line. The next part of it that I think was maybe the light bulb moment for many was my Bretton Woods, new Bretton Woods, the Bitcoin life raft piece. And that essentially was saying that, OK, what also is coming is the central banks have seen this digitization of money and they want to be involved. And they want to be involved by creating central bank digital currency, not as a competitor to Bitcoin, but as an ancillary agent within this new digital money system. And that's all well and good. That's basically government stablecoins. Fine. I get it. It's much better. It works really well. But it also has other qualities. Because the other qualities is, are it's programmable. So essentially, central banks can program money so we all have different monetary policy or different tax regimes or whatever it may be. The point being is behavioral economics is going to shoehorn its way in to monetary and fiscal policy, which are combining. And at that point, we are really beholden to what central banks do. Can they destroy money? Can they destroy our capital, our savings? Of course they can. And we needed a life raft. And Bitcoin was going to be it. Now, as we wind forward, we're now seeing pretty much every government on Earth running record deficits. This means that, theoretically, they're all bankrupt. But we know in this modern world of printing of money, bankruptcy in governments doesn't mean the same thing unless you can't print money. Hence, why emerging markets go bankrupt, developed markets don't. So the answers to these record deficits is all the story of debt, really, right? How do you finance that debt? Well, you finance it in the age-old way. Taxation, inflation, and debasement. So taxation around the world is going up everywhere, without question. And there's very little things you can do about that because of the legalities, whether you like it or not. But inflation and debasement, they're two different things. Now, Central banks around the world have put inflation targets that are higher than where we are now. Will they be able to meet those? My view remains and has been for the last 20 years, or maybe even 30 years, no. I don't think inflation is structurally able to be generated. I could be wrong. Of course I could. Let's wait and see the massive amounts of fiscal stimulus that has to come. Because these deficits aren't going away. There's another round of huge stimulus to come this year in the US alone, let alone Europe. Now, Europe is obviously slowing down with the virus again. There is more stimulus to come. And there's more stimulus almost everywhere. And 
So I don't think maybe that that infrastructure spend generates inflation. Maybe it's just cyclical. Maybe it's structural. Maybe everything changes. I do not see how you get around the rise of technology, the aging population, uh, globalization, and the dynamics of debt. I don't know how you generate inflation in that. So let's assume that that doesn't happen. It's cyclical, spooks the bond market, the Fed do yield curve control, and expand their balance sheet again when that happens. So that's an interesting thing. But monetary debasement is the thing that I thought about. And I think people confuse inflation, CPI, and debasement. You see, most people are looking for the dollar to collapse, not really thinking through the fact that everybody else is also printing money. And it seems to be, sure, the dollar might go lower when they're doing more than the Europeans. But, but overall, if you look with honesty at the DXY, something that I was expecting to see break higher, i.e. the dollar higher over last year, and it didn't. And But when I look at the chart, it didn't break lower either, because everybody thought that. It kind of looks like it's range bound at about 96 as the average. So therefore, currencies don't move. But that's, in, that's interesting. That got me thinking. And rates can't really move either, because if they go up, then yield curve control comes in. If they go down, they're going to try and stimulate more. So then rates come drift higher a bit. So let's say US 10-year rates are maybe range bound between 0 and 2%. Maybe they go negative, maybe not. But either way, there's no rates trade to be had. The, the death of macro in rates, I think, is writ large. And I know many people think, no, no, you know, you can short rates forever. You know, inflation's coming back. Yeah, but the central bank are not going to do that. And we've seen that in Japan. So what's very interesting is that as yield curve control comes in, it means that they buy bonds and they, the central bank buy bonds by printing money. So I've looked at that and I've looked at Okay, if there's no inflation, then where is this monetary printing going? And the argument had been for a long time that I didn't agree with, that QE found its way into financial markets. And I thought, I don't see that mechanism per se. Of course, it finds its way in some places. Wealthier people... Corporates with better balance sheets find it easier to borrow. Um, you see it, you know, in the credit markets, how easy they are, that kind of thing. I get that. But the equity market was the one that didn't really pass the smell test because the equity market rose on the back of QE, but volumes didn't. So then what's the buy? Where is the buy? What's going on? And at that point, I started looking at chart of Bitcoin versus other assets. And many of you will have seen this in Macro Insiders and also um, on Twitter. And so what became clear, and this was kind of, we're now talking about September, October last year, that Bitcoin was about, had already, and was about to outperform every single asset on earth. So all of the charts of, let's say, Bitcoin versus the S&P, Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ, Bitcoin versus gold, Bitcoin versus real estate, Bitcoin versus anything, anything I could find, any asset. Sure, you can all find a single stock that's done better, but an asset class. Not one asset class on earth looked like it was going to outperform Bitcoin. I'd never seen anything like that in my entire career. That made me pay attention. And then I put it against the Fed balance sheet. First, I looked at the S&P versus the Fed balance sheet, because the Fed balance sheet is the purest expression of monetary printing. I also use the, the G4 central bank balance sheets to look at the global printing of money. But let's use the S&P versus the Fed balance sheet. You can see the chart here. The market basically fell in 2008 80% and traded sideways ever since in this chart. What's interesting is gold looks similar. So if you look at the chart of gold divided by the central bank balance sheet, it looks similar. And if I look at the chart of real estate versus the central bank balance sheet, it too looks similar. 
But if I look at the chart of gold, which is the oldest denominator, the form of money, against the S&P, the S&P doesn't look particularly expensive, a little bit expensive, but not the bubble that we're seeing. And that got me thinking about these relative asset prices and the fact that Bitcoin was outperforming everything. And I realized that I think we're all looking at this wrong, and I certainly had been. What that chart shows, or those charts, is that the denominator, which is not the US dollar per se, but the value of fit currency in terms of what assets it could buy, because these are all fixed assets essentially, or low supply assets. Anything that was a low supply asset was going up in price, but it was going up in price in dollar terms. But when you look in money printing terms, they were basically holding their own after the massive collapse of 2008. And that intuitively feels right to us. You know, the anger and the frustration and the economic misery that's happened since is a function of that. And that makes sense. Variable inputs like consumer goods and wages were destroyed by this. And that makes sense too. So with your wage, you were able to buy less assets. So if assets are a way to create savings for future consumption, you were able to buy less of them. And so in lies the pension crisis. So in lies the ability for millennials to buy housing. So in lies why the middle classes got hold out. Now, obviously, wages is also a competition amongst global workers. It's also a competition, importantly, against technology, which is slowly grinding away and destroying job after job after job. So this is creating this imbalance. So everyone's dead right. The central banks are creating the problem here because they're doing the age-old thing of debasing currency. Everybody's looking the wrong way because they're looking for CPI inflation, saying cost of goods are going up. Yes and no. The cost of some things are going up, um, things like that, that are driven by the baby boomers because they've been the driver of inflation, stuff like healthcare, and also their kids, the millennials, the record number, drove up the cost of tuition. That's actually coming down now because they're all coming out of university age and the Gen Z generation is smaller. But the boomers still drive that. But overall, the basket of goods falls but the basket of fixed assets keeps going up. And what it's doing, it's just readjusting its price terms versus the fall in the denominator since 2008, which is the endless printing of money. So it's not that it's creating a bubble. The bubble is in the central bank balance sheet. The assets are not in a bubble because when you look at them relative to each other, they make pretty much total sense. So that's a big change of thinking, and you need to think about what that means. But the only asset in the world that is offsetting the monetary printing is not gold, it's Bitcoin. Bitcoin has not only offset the monetary printing, but massively outperformed it. One other asset has, which is the NASDAQ, after 2008. Before 2008, no. Bitcoin didn't exist before 2008 either. So in fair terms, the NASDAQ does. And I'll come on to that towards the end. But Bitcoin is the one thing that is outperforming the Fed balance sheet. And that means that it is offsetting the debasement of currency. We can look at this trend globally too. It works for the MSCI world versus the G4 central banks. Everything is basically a function of any limited supply asset is exploding in price. This is where the art market's gone up, the wine market's gone up, the classic car market's gone up. It's not because rich people have exponentially more money. Well, they do because they can buy these things and they go up in price. But actually, even real estate has only basically offset that debasement of currency. Once I realized that, and that Bitcoin was going to be the super massive black hole that eats all other asset classes, I just realized there was no point doing anything else. It's the same point we launched Real Vision Crypto because I realized that this is the biggest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. And the more time I spend here, the bigger it is. I wildly underestimated how big this all is. Now, there is a school of thought now that 
Bitcoin, as it develops, becomes the one true money. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. Is it probable? Less probable, I think. Um, I don't really believe in the Gresham's law that all money attracts goes to the hardest form of money. I don't think that's been proven out over time, but I understand the arguments and, you know, right now it doesn't matter. Um, also, but I do believe that Bitcoin is the foundation stone of what we need for a new financial system because we're certainly destroying the one we're in and it's stealth destruction, right? There's no bond market collapse. The equity market is not allowed to collapse because the central bank prints money every time. Now, that money doesn't flow into the stock market. The stock market's repricing. Again, just to get this across, here's the chart of the Venezuelan stock market. It's gone exponential. Here's the chart of the Venezuelan stock market in dollar terms. It's collapsed from the currency deval and then traded sideways since. That is exactly the same mechanism. It was exactly the same mechanism in the Weimar Republic. Now, I don't necessarily know or think we go that far, but who the fuck knows? That's why we need the right life raft, because we're going into unprecedented times. Now, what's so cunning about this strategy, it doesn't show up in the bond market. And even if it does, it gets hidden. It doesn't show up in CPI, because it doesn't change the cost of computers or TVs or food. It doesn't do that. It doesn't show up in things that look bad. The equity market goes up. Hurrah! It's not obvious to people how they're getting screwed, but everybody knows they're getting screwed. It's the change in the denominator, the devaluation of fiat currency overall, that means you cannot buy as many assets as you could, and therefore your structural savings are worse. Now, with record low interest rates, you now have no chance of making money. Well, not until Bitcoin turned up. Bitcoin was the game changer. That supermassive black hole that people were going to realize was going to suck everybody in. And it is definitely going to form this basis of the financial system because it is pristine collateral. The collateral where, right now, collateral for the whole market is US treasuries. But bizarrely enough, you can just create more of them. So why would I hold your collateral if you keep creating more, more of it and the yields fall? So I get rewarded less for lending out my collateral to you? Why should I? Bitcoin, entirely different. The structure of Bitcoin means that, that you can't create more of it. So as a piece of collateral, it's extremely valuable. It doesn't change because more people, because the government can print more of it, like the current collateral. So it is pristine. It's also a fantastic store of value because of the limited supply and all of the other parts of it, the, 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 the robustness of, and distributed network. It's an incredibly powerful technology that we all kind of know by now. So that takes me into about December. And in December, I started digging into Ethereum. And I wanted to understand the crypto space at large. Because when somebody tells me, and many people did, don't look at anything else, you're a scammer, you're a shitcoiner, you're a fraud, if I look at something else, that makes me want to look at it. And I started digging into Ethereum. And I realized how incredibly robust an ecosystem it was. The amount, the sheer number of developers, programmers, applications, the ecosystem was bigger than Bitcoin. The growth in wallet addresses was about the same pace as Bitcoin. So I started thinking about that. I got sent an article by, um, I think it was the NYDIG guys, and they were looking at Metcalfe's law. And I understood Metcalfe's law um, and how it probably applied to Bitcoin. But I asked Remy and actually reached out to Santiago Velez and said, listen, can you help me develop a, a Metcalfe's law model? Just a simple one. We don't need the complex maths. We need to kind of prove that Bitcoin is basically priced in that. And maybe that stock to flow is representing that in a different way. And again, I'm not trying to refute the stock to flow model. I use it. I love it. Everything Plan B is done is a game changer. Um, and he deserves all the plaudits. But once I started understanding the power of what Bitcoin was, it was clearly a behavioral economics 
driven model, the best of all. So behavioral economics in Facebook is why Metcalfe's law exists in Facebook is because it originally you bring on your uncle, your aunt, your friend from school, blah, 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 and you create your network of people and you can keep in contact with them and you can communicate with them. And so that became network effects. And then businesses came onto it, created more network effects, et cetera. But the shareholders were the ones who got rich, not the users. The shareholders benefited from the exponential revaluation of the network because Metcalfe's law essentially is the value of the network goes up with the more nodes in operation. And so the users were separate from the capital. So the investors got rich and the users got to talk to their friends and then their parents joined Facebook and they all left <laughs> into Instagram, etc. But Bitcoin was a groundbreaker. And sorry, all of the Silicon Valley models were basically all of the same. They were all Metcalfe's law. Everything that came out of the internet, from Google to Facebook to Reddit, the whole damn lot of them. And they were all came out of meetings with people like Daniel Kahneman, the, one of the godfathers of behavioral economics, who basically taught them how to trigger dopamine receptors in the brain by like buttons, emoticons, and how emotion drives behavior, because it's all behavior is what you're trying to do. But with Bitcoin, you've created a network driven by behavioral economics, which is the network of money. And every participant gets rewarded by bringing participants in. So that creates an incredibly robust network effect. In fact, it's genius. Because more of us who believe in it, the more we attract other people in, the more we all get rewarded for it. So the behavioral incentive is extraordinary. And that is a way to gain adoption for a new money, because otherwise it's very hard to do. It's very hard to get adoption unless you get rewarded. So this is stunningly good. But I wondered how you could value Ethereum, because I, I could start to see how I could value Bitcoin and why it is exponential, why we have to use log charts. It's because the network effects of more people mean that the chart is always exponential. And we've only just started. I mean, we've got billions of people to bring onto this. So this is going a lot further. As I've talked about, you know, I have no problem when I use you know, this log chart, for example. It would suggest potentially this rally could take us to 400,000, maybe even a million on an offshoot because of the wall of money that I've talked about as institutions come in. Maybe or not. Maybe plan B stock to flow is right and it gets that 288. I don't know doesn't really matter right now, but I think be surprised because that's what network effects go more exponential over time. But when I looked at Ethereum, the thing I was told not to look at, I realized that not only was the technology very interesting, and yes, it has problems, and yes, it's very different to Bitcoin, and in fact, it's not even a competitor to Bitcoin. It's just part of a new digital asset ecosystem. I realized that Ethereum was actually probably the basis of the internet of value. And the Internet of Value is something hard to get your head around as well. I'll talk a bit about it later. But basically, anything that you exchange that has value is going to be digitized. And Ethereum is breaking the ground for that. Now, there's the Ethereum 2.0 coming out, which actually hardens it as a platform and lowers the supply and speeds it up and probably cheapens the cost. There are, you know, it, it is not perfect. Like, Bitcoin is not perfect for certain things. There is a massive ecosystem also being built in layer two solutions. And Ethereum has layer two solutions too, but it's also able to be changed, which is not Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is this hard, super wonderful asset of money. Ethereum is not that. So this war between Bitcoin and Ethereum is nonsense. They're not even the same thing. So I started to get the internet of value and we started to see the rise of DeFi, and I'll come on to that again. So you could start to see real applications that were getting massive network effects immediately. And then I put Ethereum in the same terms as I looked at the network effects of Bitcoin, which was using essentially number of active wallet addresses. And it's a simplistic way of showing network effects. And what it showed was Metcalfe's law. When I put it against Bitcoin, if you see the chart here, you can see it's basically exhibiting the same traits 
as Bitcoin in Metcalfe's law, but actually the adoption's earlier and faster. And then when I put the chart of Ethereum against Bitcoin, starting at 5 million wallet addresses, to rebase them to a point where network effect starts taking hold, their prices were identical and the chart patterns were identical, but they were about four years different. That was like, whoa. So these are being valued exactly the same at different points because it's only the network effect that's valuing them. And that was incredibly exciting discovery. And I realized that the entire space is driven by network effects only. And that, you know, and then you understand that some tokens and some get network effect and then have S-curve moments. So they start to look like they get adopted, nobody really uses it, and it falls. That's called the S-curve. The S-curve could be a failure or a pivot or a change in use, and then it goes. So we've seen that. We see that in businesses and startups all the time, um, and we've seen it in Bitcoin, where the narrative has changed. Mount Gox, it's going to be a scam. It's all about dirty money, Bitcoin goes off, 2013, S-curve. Back up, exponential, it survives, and we go into the next set of FUD narratives, S-curve. That, that was the banning by China, the forking, and all the other stuff, S-curve. Then back up again, so now we've got the Lindy effect, which is basically, if you can't destroy it, it's gonna get stronger. Um, and Ethereum's going through the same, and this whole space goes through the same. Some fail, some that don't fail, get stronger. That was mind-blowing to me. I now realized I had a framework of understanding that I could apply to anything within this space. So that was the big growth for me. And when you look at the speed of which this happens, because don't forget, exponential means it gets faster all the time. In log charts, it looks normal. It's, a, it's kind of linear, but actually it's non-linear in its move. And we've seen this. I mean, I don't know. I, I had an interview with CZ who built Binance, in three years, he went to the largest crypto exchange and one and a half thousand employees. I think it's the fastest startup in history. Speaking to Sam at FTX, I mean, I don't know how he did it, but he got this whole from idea to launching in four or five months, and then a year later, the third largest exchange in the world. Look at Coinbase. 56 million accounts. That's more than Robin Hood and Fidelity added together. It's astonishing the network effect. And we're bringing in the institutions and they're spreading into Ethereum. And everybody else is building products on Ethereum. It's coming at a lightning speed. And it's, I don't think the space can catch up with the narrative change that is happening so fast. You know, first was the, the, the rise of alternative protocols, interoperability, polka dots, chain links, etc. You know, the alternatives to, to um, Ethereum, things like Cardano, different types, non-blockchain, like Hedera. And the list is endless. And I know you're going to say, you didn't mention my favorite coin. I don't really care at this point. There's too many of them. I can't figure them out. But there are some really exciting things because I sit back as a macro guy and look at the mega trends. What is the mega trend here? First, DeFi. Holy shit. Here is a whole lending borrowing system, probably insurance system, all distributed on blockchain. This is what the world needed. Now, it's really nascent. Some of these are going to blow up. Some are going to work. Which ones do? I don't know. I'm investing in a whole bunch of these and I just hold them as a basket. But, oh my God, this is changing everything. This Bitcoin lending markets. Remember what I was talking a year ago, is like, well, we need a Bitcoin yield curve. Christ, it's happening everywhere. There's yield curves popping up on everything. So this is all going on. DeFi space is exploding. I've now got friends of mine who are like sold some of their Bitcoin and then gone through the realization that they don't even need to put it back in a bank because they put it into a stable coin, USDC, and earn 8%. Why even go to a bank? Because then they can send it somewhere else instantaneously. You only need to go to a bank when you want to buy a physical asset in the real world. But savings assets don't really need to be in the real world. So, I mean, this is game changing. So anybody who's complaining about, I can't get enough, 
interest or my savings, well, here's a world for you that's come out of DeFi that allows you to do it. What risks are you running? Well, it's not clear what all the risks are, but it's not clear what risks you're running in your pension fund when your fund manager invests in corporate credit. You don't know what it is. But I do know they're investing in more junk bonds than they've ever done in history. So as long as you spread your risk out, then you're probably going to be okay. Because there's unlikely to be catastrophic risk. There's going to be regulatory risk, without question. But regu regulators only want to put this into their control so they know that there's no money laundering and you're paying your taxes. Bog standard stuff. And we see it everywhere. The narrative of, oh my God, the regulation, they're going to kill it. It's bullshit, everybody. It's very clear when you see and speak to the regulators. That is not the case. It's very clear that this green narrative, you know, it's dirty money, it's terrible. It's just a narrative there spread, I think, by the ECB to slow adoption. And that's, that's all okay. You know, everyone's got their game to play in this. They want to get their digital currencies out. They want to be able to interact with this new system. But when they do, I mean, the ECB have talked about DeFi being a core part of this, and I think the US will too. And it's already happening across Asia and China. I'll come on to that in a bit. So DeFi, all the lending, that it wants to integrate with the new financial system. Why? Because the European banks are fucked. So are the Japanese banks. So you can change all of that by using DeFi and central bank digital currencies, and then that interoperable or connecting on-ramps and off-ramps to Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrency world. It's all there. It's all coming. So this whole financial system that I've talked about is being built in front of our goddamn eyes. And people are still fighting it, saying, well, you know, Bitcoin, I don't know, it's a bit risky, right? I mean, really? It's all happening. Everything you've ever wanted. All of you who hate the Fed. All of you who want gold. All of you who don't trust the equity market. It's all here. This world is coming at you fast. But there's more than that. The next big thing to come out was NFTs. And here we go again, a lot of teeth sucking. Well, they're a bubble. I don't think you even know what NFTs are if you think it's a bubble. What they are is a way of authenticating assets digitally. That is something the world needs because all of this internet of value that's being built across Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the other protocols and elsewhere is all about trust. So when you put something on an NFT, you're creating trust. And trust creates scarcity. And scarcity creates value. Now, this is where everybody gets NFTs wrong. They're like, well, what, we can just put anything on, on an NFT, attach it to an NFT, and now it's valuable? No. Some of that stuff is trading because it's proof of concept going on. Most of this meme stuff is worth zero. Most of this stuff is worth zero. But what Beeple did was real. You see, Beeple's piece of art was groundbreaking. A, it was the digital journey of his artwork. Over 5,000 pieces of art over 14 years which in itself is extraordinary. That sold for $69 million, as we all know. That's about 15 grand a piece of art. So actually not that valuable. But what it was was a real artist that was acknowledged by the art world, i.e. people who want to put money into the asset, as valuable. And that's great. It was actually outbid by not the art world, but by somebody from the crypto space who also appreciates it. And there's a good story behind that too. So Beeple's art was groundbreaking because this was as abhorrent to most people as, let's say, Damien Hirst and his shark in formaldehyde, or Tracy Emin and that messy room, or any of the modern wave of British artists, as abhorrent as Jackson Pollock was with his spray paint, his stuff, or Andy Warhol was. Everything that comes out of art that has real value is generally not considered to have value by the majority, they think it's ridiculous. How can a piece of digital stuff that can be replicated be worth anything? Well, interestingly enough, it's all about authentication. So photographs have value. Original photographs that are signed by the photographer have real value. If you own the negative, it has even more value. A book 
that is printed has value, whatever value that is, minimal. A book, a first edition of that book has rarity, it has more value. A first edition of that book signed by the author has more value. A first edition of a book signed by William Shakespeare has almost limitless value. So it's the layers of rarity that come into it. And NFTs do that. So I'm really interested in that NFT space because it spreads. It's not just about art. Art is an easy way of looking at it. And also, by the way, just think about what a painting is. Yeah, but you know, a Michelangelo painting, that's worth millions, but this piece of art is rubbish. It's only digital. Well, that's a piece of cotton canvas uh, with some paint on it. Total cost, current price, probably about 50 bucks. But you can trade at $500 million. And the premium is the price of the art and the authenticity and the rarity. So art is, is you know, it's a very subjective market. And you know, what's nice for you or me is, is not nice for somebody else. That picture behind me is actually an NFT made by the two quants guys who uh, you know, developed the Real Vision bots that you know, we, we see on Real Vision a lot. Um, that was a, that's an NFT and I printed it out and put it on my wall. Now, is it gonna be worth anything? Not, not unless they become rich and famous um, or some other reason or the artist does, um, but it's kind of neat and it just shows that we can use NFTs in different ways. But NFTs are not just about that. NFTs, are, don't forget, is, is attaching scarcity and value and trust to an asset digitally. So it can apply to real assets like wine. It can attach to real estate. So we're, we're all waiting for the growth of tokenized real estate. And as securities laws change and come up to speed, we're going to see an explosion in that. My guess is the next cycle, we will see a massive change. Now, why, is, why should real estate be tokenized? Real estate should be tokenized because it stops just the rich people getting rich in the high-end real estate. Because again, if you remember, because of the monetary debasement and the fact that they get more money, they get to invest in the more expensive property, which goes up more because there's more money in that space and everybody else gets left behind. But if you tokenize it, everybody can own a share. So you can have the same percentage share of your net worth in it as a multi-billionaire. That's groundbreaking. That's all of this digital space does that. It completely levels the playing field. So the Beeple art, interesting enough, there was another bunch of Beeple art that was bought and then tokenized and then sold. And I'll come to that story a bit in the metaverse, um, but that truly was groundbreaking because everybody can own it. So one rich guy can own the $69 million piece and a bunch of ordinary people can own the rest. Phenomenal, massive game change. And it's not like a REIT. A REIT has all sorts of rinky-dink shit in it. It's not a pure play. It's different. Um, you actually physically have legal title as a part of it with an NFT. But NFTs also game-changing for the music industry. So if you see my conversations with people like RAC, Andre, Andre is pioneering that. We've seen the Kings of Leon. We've seen a bunch of bands starting to realize that this is going to disrupt the middlemen in music. 80% of all Money in music goes to middlemen, not the artist, which is kind of insane. We think bankers are egregious in what they take. Well, in this, it's really all of the economics. But when you can put your own things on the blockchain and sell them directly to your community as NFTs, well, then you're, you've got a direct relationship with your community. I'll come on to communities a bit more in a sec. But that's fascinating. But what's more fascinating is the fact that you can then price scarcity for different people. So if the bulk of your people will buy your album or stream it for free so you get paid virtually nothing from Spotify, then there's the next tier, and currently that's the people who go to concerts. So your concert ticket's 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Okay, so you've got extracted more value from people because it's rarer because you get to see the artist physically. And then you might have the meet and greet, which you pay a bit more money for. Okay, that's basically all there is for artists. And then the rest have to do by, you know, whoring themselves out to brands. Oh, here, I love Nike shoes. I mean, it's like, really? When what they've got is this massive community of millions of people, they can also provide rarer assets to them. So in the case, for example, you could provide a single recording that nobody else has 
and give it to your super fan and it could be worth millions. So you can monetize all across your fan base, much like most subscription-based businesses do. So that creates revenue streams for musicians. They also could put their IP rights on. So as they move around, they automatically accrue IP. Um, and you can sell baskets of IP rights. We're already seeing our artists sell you know, their back catalogs, but if you tokenize them and sell them, you could have still part of the stream. Maybe you maintain 20%, much like Beeple has with his art and some of these NFTs are with art. It changes the economics and gets rid of middlemen. It just ekes out more for the actual people. That I think is really interesting. We're also seeing the rise of community tokens and people haven't quite seen this yet, but this is coming and it's going to be gigantic. So there is a platform called Socios that has a coin called Chili's, which I don't own, um, but they have built community tokens for big football clubs, soccer clubs in Europe, um, AC Milan, FC Barcelona, a bunch of others. And what as a fan you get is a token of which you can get benefits. So they're like fan club benefits, including voting for the what kind of kit they wear or you know, some, of the, some of the choices. So you're actually involved. Your community token has meaning. So it also has value. So if the team does better, your token's worth better. And you're kind of part of that ecosystem and it will give you benefits like tickets and stuff like that. So that is the start of where this is going. Everybody who monetizes online in any way, shape or form is going to have a token. Right now we're used to subscription models. Right now artists, for example, or influencers have to leverage Google and Facebook um, to basically monetize. And that's where brands and themselves meet and they, and they, they use advertising and other methods. But once you've got community that has a token and you have direct access to them, then you can monetize in a number of ways and create value for the community. Or you can destroy value for the community. But that's for the community to be involved in and you can share in successes. And we're going to see this from everybody from sports stars to YouTube channels to um, actors and actresses through to charities, through to, I mean, you name it. Anything with a community is going to tokenize. And it's going to unlock vast amounts of value. It's going to unlock ability for people to participate and feel part of something, of a society which has its own form of money. And the money can go up and down in value, or it may be stable, it may be utility and function. And that's okay, but you can't be part of the society without it. But once you've got it, it means the artist can speak to you directly, or the charity, or whatever. So community is going to be explosive. People like Rally and stuff like that, I, people have no comprehension how large this is going to be. I think it's one of the largest underpriced parts of the market because people haven't got their heads around it. We haven't even got our heads around insurance and all of the other kind of contingent stuff, betting, that all comes onto smart contracts. That hasn't really got off the ground because we've still got the problem with regulation. Regulation is so fucking far behind where it needs to get to. They're still trying to figure out what's a security or not when the fact is you need to rewrite securities laws because this has nothing to do with securities. This is a whole new asset class. So in fourth turning terms, we need a new infrastructure, new institutions. I think it's coming. You can't launch central bank digital currencies and then not reinvent it. And we're seeing Asia much faster adopting how this plays out. And that's massively important to rewrite all regulation from scratch not shoehorn it into stupid old regulation that requires endless court cases. Figure it out properly. Um, and I think, I think the institutions are keen to do that. It just takes time. And it's frustrating for businesses trying to build at lightning speeds when they don't really know, are they gonna get prosecuted for this or not? And that's not right when you're building something so incredible. But that's not all. So, all of that fits into even something larger, which is we are creating digital worlds, which we can call the metaverse. And I urge you to watch the interview that I did with Pierce Kicks of Delphi Digital um, about this. And this is the world where everything is digitized. Barry Silbert launched all of this to us 
really early on when he started to talk about Decentraland. Within the digital world, there are three million gamers. Those gamers live in an alternative world where they socialize with each other. So when I went to see a friend of mine, my old friend Daryl, went to see his, him at his house, his son, Harry, was playing, I think it was Fortnite. And I wasn't really aware of this. I knew Fortnite was the biggest game in the world, but I wasn't really sure why Harry on a Saturday would be in a gaming chair with the headphones on, on Fortnite on a sunny day. And Daryl's like, well, he's been out, he's played football, but now he's socialising with his mates. And I'm like, what do you mean? So we used to get to the, to the shopping mall. Um, and he's like, yeah, well, they don't do that now because his friends are spread around. He said, they, they do it online. And for some of you, you're all like, duh, obviously. And to the rest of you watching this, you're going to be, what? So they hang out and talk to each other and play games together and interact and swap things and trade things with each other. Within these games, there is systems of money, tokens, earning a living, everything. And those, that's one game, and there's many of these games. And these games are becoming interoperable, where they connect with each other and all digital universes. And those digital universes have now money that can start spreading from one to the other so it can be a base layer. Now, Bitcoin can do that too. But what we're seeing is monetary systems in this digital world where these digital goods have value. I mean, swords in some of these games now have yield curves because I want to lend my sword to you and you're going to have to pay me for it so you can get the experience of my level in the game. Same with skins. Or renting the ability to play at different levels in games. There's so many variations. But it's not just about gaming because... We're starting to see the rise of education living in these digital verses. We're starting to see income, businesses, real estate, all happening. There are digital architects that are building digital projects that have digital value, real value, that people are paying big money for. So let's go back to that Beeple story. So the guy who bought the Beeple had also bought a bunch of the other Beeple artwork and he created a token and he created virtual art galleries physical digital galleries, which you could visit to see the art in various metaverses. And then he threw a party on the launch of it where people could go, listen to famous DJs in different worlds at parties, play Easter egg hunts, so you're exploring this world where you had to cross from one world to another. And then you go to another party and another art gallery and so on and so forth. That's kind of telling you where this is going. So. Digital art is trading in a digital gallery with live music where in some cases millions of people, 20 million people attended in some of these kind of musical events in the digital world where people are meeting, exchanging value, conversing with each other, communicating, creating communities, earning money. And that is growing at an exponential rate. And most of us don't see it because we're not Gen Z, but Gen Z are in it. Millennials seen this edge of it, but most haven't seen it. And it is coming. And universities and schools, they can all operate in this world. You can now go into a game and play another game from a different multiverse within a game. I, it, I, it, it's beyond mind blowing. When you put a VR headset on and an Oculus Rift, and the first thing you come into is that room. You're like, oh my God, I could live in a garage and think I'm living in a beautiful house. And that's just the start of where this is going. These technologies are exponentially growing. More and more people are being absorbed into the digital world. This whole thing is like the discovery of the Americas. There is an entire new world that has enormous potential. It is going to increase global GDP massively. It might even double it because of what is happening. We're not constrained in a digital world by the same constraints of the physical world. In the world of universal basic income, people can earn money within these digital verses, not creating something, but creating something for a digital company in a digital world, earning digital money. You can live in a digital house, but live in a, your parents' bedroom. I know that makes it sound sad and it's not supposed to be. And that's just a dystopian version of this, but there's utopian sides of this too. This whole extra world, when I talk about the Bitcoin life raft, it's not just a life raft of Bitcoin, it's 
everything that we understand from digital, from value is moving and being built at a speed that none of us can comprehend. Nobody, literally nobody can keep up with what is going on. There is, it is sucking in all of the world's talent, whether it's financial talent, developer talent, philosophical talent, economic talent, everybody is going into this. So we're creating opportunity and opportunity to make money and invest at a rate of which has never been seen, I don't think, in human history. I think this is the largest wealth distribution underway that has ever happened. And it's going to happen in such a short space of time, you can't get your head around it. And the reason it's a short space of time is because we really fucking need it, right? Because this other system is destroying itself. But many of us, me included, thought that this moment that we saw in March was going to be the Big Bang. Boom, all over. How does it finish? The end game. There is no end game. The end game is the ongoing destruction and the ongoing migration. We are all migrating across. And I know there's many of you like, Raoul, I wish you'd just talk about dollar yen and, you know, I wish you'd go back to bonds or, you know, traditional macro. This is traditional macro, where it's going. Everything is going here. It's almost irrelevant to talk about the bond market when it's between 2% and zero, when you've got different yields and different assets all going on over here that are fairly priced without the influence of central banks. Why, why would you get involved? Why care if the dollar goes up 10% when you can be involved in assets that do this, when they're all on exponential adoption curves and there's new exciting technology? Why bother? Why does it matter? Why does it matter what the price of oil does over the next nine months? It doesn't. And so that's the realization. That's why so many macro people have moved across. Macro is gonna be useful as ever for hedging because all of this is still beholden to the world of business cycles, even though most business cycles have now been trodden out in terms of asset price effects because of the debasement of currency change in the denominator, but it will still have VAR shocks where everything implodes and goes down because there's too much leverage in the system and the usual bullshit that humans do. You know, what we've just seen with Archegos, it's very common. And macro is great for hedging some of that stuff, but it, but literally, I can't express to you how big this is and the opportunity. So if we look at the traditional macro world, of which I've now highlighted that I think there's a death of macro, I don't think currencies really move. I don't think bond yields really move, and not in terms of secular bet moves where we can make big money by you know, following a career in this shit. That's done. So what does it leave? It leaves equities, okay, and it leaves crypto. And so we're just gonna see more money. Yes, we've got commodities as well. Credit, that's pinned to rates, so that's all gone. Credit's gone, bonds are gone, short-term rates are gone, FX training's gone. I mean, yes, emerging markets are function of equities and further out the risk curve, but really it's gonna force more money and more people to migrate into the source of returns. Now, what's extraordinary is the alpha that this space generates. The alpha is like I've never seen before. Alpha in digital assets, because there's so many of them, they're complicated, everything's going under network effects, that, that you know, people who are buying tokens who really understand it are generating massive returns at this point in the cycle. It is cyclical, they will have points where they'll lose shit tons of money. But over time, because it's network effect, it doesn't revert to the mean like silver did after 1980. It doesn't work like that. Exponential assets revert to the exponential moving average, so it's always rising, which is what Bitcoin's done all the way through. Facebook's done, Google's done, all of these have done. And so, yes, these tokens, some of them will go to zero, but the whole token space and these guys, they're gonna have boom bust cycles and they will keep going up exponentially. There's also the trading firms that trade crypto, algorithm traders, short-term traders, macro guys, everybody. The amount of alpha those guys are generating is unheard of and it will happen in the down cycle too because they will capture some of the down cycle there's money to be made all over this and every day there are more tokens and these tokens are complex so it's hard to trade so that's even more alpha for the people who figure it out so this space is going to be ongoing source of alpha for decades 
when all real estate's tokenized, and we can trade real estate, when people are tokenized in terms of future careers or job paths or all sorts of parts, from community tokens, when you can trade FC Barcelona against AC Milan community tokens, and you can arbitrage it with something else. I mean, oh my God, you can't get your head around this. So if we look at the traditional asset space, which is dying, you know, equities, bonds, they're all kind of credit, they're all kind of 100, 200, 300 trillion dollar markets. The crypto market is 2 trillion. That's 100x from here. But I think it eats all of those assets over time. So whether it's, maybe it's 200x. No, it won't be a straight line. But this is the biggest change in financial markets, the system of money and economics and, and how economies are run in all of history in the fastest, shortest time it's ever happened. And people are going to be tribal about it. People are going to catch hold of their own narratives to make sense of this world. But this world is unstoppable. It is coming. It will have massive boom-bust cycles. There will be periods of time when you'll lose money and periods of time when you'll feel like a god. But that is opportunity. Because in an exponential world, risk doesn't equal reward. Reward massively outsizes risk, as long as you're not stupid about how you invest. So I just thought it was important because it's simply the most important thing I've ever seen in my life. And I keep talking about it, but I wanted to bring everything together to get it across how big this is and why I spend a lot of my time in this space. Because everything else seems dull. But in my journey of understanding and my migration to this other world, it gave me a new lens to understand the world we're in now and the opportunities that are coming. I'm a big believer in Neil Howe and William Strauss's book, The Fourth Turning. I really do think we are in the fourth turning as we speak, where new infra institutions, new forms of government and new ways of doing things develop. And they develop over, you know, 10, 15 year period. And I think we're in the middle of that. I think this digital revolution is clearly the most fourth turning thing on, on the planet. But I also think something else is happening. And this is interesting to me because it's giving me optimism because the world is pretty fucked, right? We've got the pension system that's broken. And it can't afford to pay the baby boomers and the, and the millennials hadn't been financialized. They've now been financialized. They've started to understand markets, but maybe not in the best way yet. We've got the debt burden. We've got too many people. We've got aging populations as well that are, dragging on growth and you know the debt bubbles and all of this stuff, right? The stuff we know, the broken banking system, the rich poor divide and all the misery and shittery of the world around us. But Bitcoin gave me hope that there was an answer. And my very first video about the pension crisis said, well, this is the asset you actually need to buy. And that proved out pretty damn good. But I'm starting to see that this is about to coincide with a bunch of other mega secular trends. I think we are entering what I'm referring to as the exponential age. And it's going to be ignited by the stimulus that's coming because the stimulus is being pushed into areas to develop a new economy because people need to understand that the old economy can't generate GDP growth, just simply can't, it's proven. G GDP growth keeps ratcheting lower after every recession and lower. So if we just did the same thing repeatedly, this time around GDP growth should average about 1%. How do you change that? You change it by investing in technology. And we so happen to be at a point in time where more things have come together at the same point than ever before. And I realized this a while ago when I realized that Europe was hurtling towards a green future and what it was doing. And I'm not gonna talk about all this, there's way too much to absorb, and it's a whole conversation for another day, but it's something I wrote in Global Macro Investor. But right at the same time, have we've got the revolution of digital value and money, the entire monetary system, the exchange of value, the store of value, everything, and the digital world within which we live, we've also got the EV and green energy revolution the digitization of emerging markets, the internet of things, virtual reality, 
wearable technology, biotech, 3D printing, autonomous vehicles, robots, AI, distributed computing, 5 and 6G, and space Wi-Fi, all rolling out in the next five years. That is unbelievable. I don't think ever in history, all of these things are get working now, but we're going to hit Metcalfe's law on every one of these in the next five years. And yes, it, there will be ups and downs and there will be bubbles and booms and busts, but we're going to see the largest group of things in an exponential trend than we've ever seen before. It's a new era. It's the exponential age and it is going to be a golden age of opportunity. As we leave this old way of doing things, where we transition from the fourth turning into this new way, the new way is going to offer unprecedented opportunities to redistribute wealth. So we're gonna be there, I'm gonna be there on this journey. I'm trying to get my head around all of this now. But hopefully, I've given you the big dump so you're all on the same page as me with this whole digital world the world of digital assets, and let's keep discovering more. It's all a journey of learning. None of us know what's going on. None of us know where it goes. All we know, it's going there fast. All right, I hope that was helpful, everybody. Good luck, and just keep adding into the dips, because this thing is going up. So welcome to the footnotes. Um, as I said at the beginning, I wanted to add some extra bits onto the end and I didn't want to shoehorn it into the middle of the video so you see these weird cuts. Again, this is really a free thought piece from me where I'm just dumping everything on my mind. And I realized when I'd gone through it, there's a few things I really need to clarify or go into more detail of. The first thing, and I think it's probably the single most important point I'm trying to get across at the beginning of this video, is this central bank debasement. You know, we talk about changing the denominator because the denominator is falling. But I realize I haven't really got across clearly or super clear what that is. Now, you'll hear Michael Saylor talk about this too, and I, I think he does a good job, but it's still not quite clear. The actual thing is the central bank balance sheets to, since 2008, whether we're using the Fed or the G4 central bank balance sheets, since the 2008 crisis started, they've been devaluing um, or increasing the balance sheet at about 15% a year and 13% after 2008 started because that was obviously going from a very small base. The percentages move accordingly. But with that debasement, what we're trying to do is make sure our investments outperform that 15% fall in the denominator, i.e. the rise of the central bank balance sheets. So, we're now looking for a hurdle where of 15%. Now, that's pretty tough even for the equity markets to do. 15% is pretty unheard of, but that's what we're looking for. So we're looking for assets that rise more than 15% or at least hold water versus that 15%. If not, we're actually getting poorer. And this is this rich poor divide that I talk about, because if you can't buy these assets that increase more than 15%, you're not generating wealth. You're just keeping in line with the devaluation of fiat currency. And this is creating that 99% that and the 1% divide, is that inability to own the assets that outperform debasement means you're not generating net wealth. So really important point. So also some other key points and observations about stuff happening within this space. I don't think I spent enough time talking about the interoperability layer. Now, how I describe this is, you know, we kind of started this whole crypto journey back in 2013, for me at least, with Bitcoin, and then Ethereum came, and then we've seen these other tokens, some have survived, some have failed this big ecosystem. And people say, well, this has got a great case for that. This has got a great case for this. And then there's a group of people saying, well, it's all going to go into one protocol. But the, a big development is people saying, you know what, it doesn't need to go in one protocol. And we'll build a layer that allows all of these things to work together. So what this means is I'm talking to you. I'm using a microphone of which you don't know what it is that condenses the sound and records it on a system that you don't know what it is. On a computer, you don't know whether it's a Mac or a PC. Um, I'm using an internet, of which you don't know what the type of modem it is. 
you don't know any of these things. And I can have a live call with you on the phone or I can have a Zoom call and you don't know or care. I can send you an email. You don't know what system I'm on. You just get the email. That's interoperability. It's one of the key features of the internet and what made the internet so successful. That is coming in crypto and it's coming fast. We've seen on Real Vision Crypto things like Quant Network, you know, Polkadot, Chainlink. These things are huge because they allow different things to move around across this ecosystem. We're seeing it in the gaming metaverse where, where a token go or a skin can go from one game to the other to the other. And those are different languages, different protocols. Some are on blockchain, some aren't. It's extraordinarily exciting. So the wave of the future is you're not going to know that some of these things are built on Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. What you care about is the end application. And we're coming closer to that. You know, in fact, NFTs are one of those because really a lot of the people, for example, buying the NBA, um, you know, slam dunk shots are actually not interested in the fact that it's it's it's. It's on Ethereum. All they care about is, or whatever protocol it happens to end up on, all they care about is the photo and the authenticator. So that's a first time I've seen a real example of that. That leads me on to another story that I didn't cover in the video, I kind of alluded to, is these layer two solutions. So we are seeing, for example, some really interesting things on the lightning layer in Bitcoin, which is using the Bitcoin protocol, but kind of speeding it up. And we've seen two big breakthroughs there. One was um, uh, Strike and the other is Bottle Pay. They're both slightly different, but what they're doing is having lightning fast payment ra rails, which is not about Bitcoin. It's actually me sending a dollar to you or sending you a euro and I start in dollars and it happens instantaneously. It's payment rails. So obviously there are many other protocols that are, that are looking at the payment rails side, but it shows that Bitcoin can do that too. And these things will be interoperable because don't forget, we've got a big monster coming, which is Facebook DM or the DM project. And that means that on Facebook, there's gonna be a universe which needs to be interoperable with everything else. And the central bank digital currency is gonna be interoperable. So these layers, this interoperability, this is a really exciting development that I think people don't really yet know how this is all gonna work, but it's coming and it's coming fast. I also didn't talk about remittances. I mean, this is another huge use case that's building rapidly. People like Abra are building out some really interesting stuff. The third world has been unbanked. And as I talked about in the video, we're hurtling in a massive quantum leap into the digital world. We're seeing it particularly in countries like India, but it's happening all across the world. You know, Filipino remittances, it's a big market for the Philippines, or down in Latin America, a lot of this is going on crypto rails. So we've seen um, Ripple and XRP with some of their use cases. We've seen that Lightning is working on this. We've seen that people like Abra are building wallets for this space. We're seeing a lot of focus on this. That's another game changer that's kind of different to a lot of this other stuff, but it's going to change the world. And that is ongoing and it's happening very fast. And I think as people get connected to the internet by the 5G, 6G and Starlink and all of the other you know, satellite Wi-Fi, we're gonna see some major changes in what it means to be banked globally. Also, I think that leads me on to another thing I didn't really talk about is we kind of tend in the crypto world to be focused on the West. We're sort of very kind of US centric with a bit of Europe, even only marginal Europe. Everything talks about like the West. But when you talk to people in Asia, you realize how incredibly advanced the Asian crypto ecosystem is. I mean, all the volumes are really coming out of Asia. Yes, there's a bit of wash trading between exchanges, but really what is happening is extraordinary things like a corporation in Malaysia that has currency restrictions is trading with a company in China that has currency restrictions and they're getting around it to the, getting around the bureaucracy, the slowness of that whole system and crossing 
the Ringgit RMB cross rate by actually doing it on Tether. Now, it doesn't have to be Tether, but Tether is the standout winner in this area. So trade payment rails are happening on stable coins. This is enormous. We don't really understand this in the West, but it is also happening at any other country level where we're seeing this. So that's why you get these kind of weird countries that are using a lot of stable coins. The narrative in the West is, oh, it's clearly, it's just capital flights and money laundering. And it's not. It's business doing business on a crypto solution. And that is incredibly powerful. Also in Asia, retail and institutional investing is much more advanced. So the use of leverage, the sophistication of the Asian trader is by far in advance of where we are in the West because they're allowed to, the regulations allow them to do it. So that's why the big uses of Binance and BitMEX and FTT are all in Asia because people can't understand how these products work. You know, Koreans and others deeply understand selling puts to generate yield and the risks that involve, because they've been doing it for decades as part of structured products. There's a structured products market that's developing there. So, you know, we've had some um, videos on Real Vision about this, but I think it, it bears understanding how advanced this is all um, going on in Asia, how big these exchanges, why the volumes are so enormous. There are some real use cases and real understanding. So don't keep your eye off that ball either. And finally, the other thing I want to bring to people to understand is we're seeing a massive spike in, let's say, option trading in the stock market, speculative activity, activity in cryptocurrencies. These things are really dramatic in their shift. But I've been thinking about this, and one of the things I realized is <clears throat> if it was the same group of people and they had suddenly become more specular, speculative, then that's different. That's a change in activity. But actually what we've done is the gigantic rise of the financialization of the millennial population. So if you look at the massive growth in Robinhood, the massive growth in Coinbase, you know, those 56 million accounts that Coinbase is coming to market with, and you see that globally, that is a younger population that has just financialized. Why? Because the millennials, like their parents, have just hit that 30-year-old mark, 32-years-old mark, when they need to get their shit sorted out and start saving. This recession we've had was the one, and who knows why, but it was the one that brought them all into the financial markets. So that step change in volumes and speculation and opening a brokerage account is not about an excessive speculative bubble building within an existing group of investors. It's new investors. Remember, when we go back to the story of inflation, the reason why we got the inflation in the 70s and 80s was this massive rise of the baby boomers going straight into this workforce and buying everything um, as they first got their first wages that led to a massive rise in prices. Now, that doesn't happen, as I talked about before, in the inflation scenario with the millennials and the boomers offsetting each other. But in the investment world, this is creating a huge new source of demand. And it's very exciting for people like us at Real Vision. It's very exciting for the crypto industry. It's very exciting for the financial industry as everybody kind of tries to catch up now and create the right product for the right world, which looks to me like it's a much more optimistic world. The reasons why Cathie Wood's ARK Invest have done so well is because the young people are investing for the future and we're seeing it and we should encourage it. Anyway, thanks. I hope the footnotes notes helped. I just wanted to get across some of these points. Um, and remember, we're all trying to offset that 15% number. And that is why we're focused here. As the crypto market gets into the phase where, where let's say, central bank printing slows down, the Fed start tapering, the global central banks taper, the economy grows, we'll probably see that traditional crypto cycle where crypto comes off. And again, that point will be the start of searching for other assets that can offset that average 15% um, devaluation of fiat currency. Anyway, thanks for your time. I hope you found it useful.